Good morning, everyone. Thanks again for joining the webinar. My name is Helen. So I work in the vendor solutions team at Bytes, and I look after Mimecast um, relationship. Just before I pass on to Paul, I wanted to give you a bit of a background on Bytes and Mimecast. So we currently um, we've benefited from a great partnership with Mimecast for a number of years now. We have the highest level of partner status, and this is based on our revenue and customer base, and also our sales and technical expertise. Um, so we have a significant customer base with 20,000 users across multiple verticals um, and have great references in the legal sector, football clubs, insurance, manufacturing, retail and food and beverage also. We're, we're fully technical certified and we also use the Mimecast service in-house currently. We, we love the service and we've got a lot of happy internal users. Um, so thanks again for joining. I will now pass over to Paul, who's our Mimecast technical pre-sales consultant, to go through his presentation. Great, thanks, Helen. Um, I'm just bring up my deck, show my screen. Uh, just need to minimise this one. Get into presenter mode. Good, right, so hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, fairly new to this go to webinar technology, but hopefully we're looking good. So um, yeah, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining the call. My name's Paul Mellings. I'm a technical pre-sales consultant here at Mimecast. And um, what I want to do over the next sort of 40 to 45 minutes is to give you an overview of what Mimecast is all about um, with a specific um, subject area around email migration support. So I'm assuming and hoping that um, many, if not all of you on the call today, are at least considering some sort of email migration project. So I guess typically that's going to be from uh, the likes of Exchange 03 to perhaps Exchange 2010, Exchange 2013, or perhaps Office 365. And Mimecast is very strong in being able to support those sorts of migrations. We've got lots of customers going through the same process as yourselves. Um, and I'm going to share with you some of the sort of thoughts, insights, recommendations around those sorts of projects on the call today. So uh, the way we're going to um, sort of map this out is I'll start with a quick review of some of the risks involved with uh, a migration when it comes to an email platform. Um, just a quick review of those. Um, I'm sure you'll be familiar with many of them, but just to kind of get us all on the same page. Um, then before we get into the actual nitty gritty of around how Mimecast can actually help with migration. Um, I think it's important that we're all clear on what Mimecast is, what our heritage is, what we do, where we've come from, um, what we provide, and how we provide it at a fairly high level. So I'm going to go through that piece first, get us all up to speed on Mimecast as a kind of technology, if you like, um, and what we provide, uh, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of specifically which elements then support the actual migration effort. Once we've done that, um, we'll have uh, a quick demonstration of the service, so what Mimecast looks and feels like from an end user perspective, um, and also if we've got time, we'll have a quick look at the administration console as well. So I don't propose to spend long on that, um, but just a quick look as to how an administrator would go about managing and controlling the Mimecast service. Um, and then a, a quick wrap-up at the end. So I've got about 40 minutes. Um, bear in mind, this is going to be fairly generalist given the time scales and given that we've got a multiple lots of different people on the um, on the call today. Um, what I would say is, yeah, do submit your questions through the, the Q&A panel, um, and then we'll say 15 minutes to the end. Helen will host that, and I'll do my best to answer the questions. Anything that we can't answer, we'll get back to you afterwards. And of course, please do um, feel free to, to sort out a time where we can talk to you separately and delve into your specific environment requirements going forwards, because as I say, this is going to be fairly general, um, and we'd be very happy um, to sit down with you and talk about your specific requirements, your own environment, and specifically how Mimecast can help along with Bytes for your requirements. Okay, so let's crack on and start with um, actually looking at um, a summary of the key risks. So the top risk with any sort of mail migration, I would say, is uh, the risk of email downtime. So, of course, email is a very critical application. People often don't realize it until such time that it actually goes down, at which point stress levels of end users go up, um, productivity goes down, and the IT department get lots and lots of calls. So email downtime is clearly not a good thing, um, and it's something that you'd want to mitigate during that migration process. Um, also thinking about not just end users, but quite often there'll be various systems and applications, maybe your uh, CRM system or marketing apps that make use of 
um, email, uh, they need to obviously be available in order to continue being productive um, during that migration. Also at the top of the list there, I would list um, lost or corrupted data. So there's plenty of scope as you're moving people's mailboxes and resource mailboxes and shared mailboxes from one place to another or one platform to another. There's clearly lots of scope there for losing data, uh, getting data corrupted, and potentially not having it, the ability to get it back again. So that's clearly a risk that you, again, want to mitigate during a project. Uh, perhaps a less obvious one is interruption to policy enforcement. So more and more we're seeing clients um, needing to enforce policy around email. So things like uh, data leak prevention type policies, whereby um, you don't want things like credit card details, perhaps, or client lists, or bank account details, or whatever it is that's sensitive to your organization. Um, you don't want that leaving via email. So you might well have um, put in place various different solutions and mechanisms to prevent that happening during the live situation here and now. Um, so how do you ensure the consistent application of those policies during the migration? So that's another consideration that uh, you just need to think about. Interdependencies with other systems. So of course, by introducing a new funky uh, technology platform, um, there's bound to be typically um, some or potentially some issues around interoperability with existing systems. So if you have, I don't know, some sort of on-premise archive solution, it might well be that you have to upgrade it in order for it to work with the new system, uh, the new platform. So things like that um, are very much um, causing people to talk to Mindcast around, well, hang on a second, just by migrating to Exchange 2010, I've now got to upgrade my whole hardware and software for my archive solution. So um, if we're going to do that, we might as well see what else is available. So there's clearly dependencies between different systems, and they need to be taken care of and considered during any planning for migration. Um, and then any and all of these things can lead to the, the two biggies, really, which is delays to the project rollout um, and spiraling costs. So um, clearly the things that you're trying to avoid during this uh, migration. So there's some of the, the key risks as we see them. And as I said, we'll get into the nitty gritty around how Mindcast supports those migration efforts to help mitigate those risks. But before we do, I just want to spend um, a few moments going through um, who are Mindcast. So what are we, where have we come from, what do we do, and how do we do it at a fairly high level, such that when you then understand those fundamentals about Mindcast, the, the areas where we can provide support in the migration will become much clearer. OK, so we um, were a UK headquartered company. We were founded. Um, about 10 years ago. In fact, it was last month we had our 10-year anniversary party. Um, and in that 10 years, we've uh, grown significantly. And we've got a, a wide and varied um, significant customer base now, something like um, over 6,500 customers worldwide, um, 2 million or more end users. Um, and it's across all industry sectors. So um, we're particularly strong in the likes of legal and finance, um, given our heritage around email archiving. Uh, so we have something like um, over 70% of the top 100 UK law firms using Mindcast. But that's, that's not the only sector. We're, we're popular across all sectors, um, from you know, things like premiership football clubs, um, leisure and industry, travel transport, everything you can imagine are using Mindcast. Now, in that time, we've grown significantly, um, very fast growth year on year, something like 56% revenue growth year on year. Um, and that was kind of underpinned last year, um, last September, in fact, by an investment by um, a, a venture capitalist. They gave us, what, $62 million um, investment in order to grow the platform and continue moving towards our long-term vision of becoming the de facto information bank for corporates out there. We've got presence globally, so yeah, we're headquartered in the UK, but we've got, uh, I think it's 11 data centers and counting um, across all regions. So we've got grids in Europe, USA, Africa, offshore, and we're currently building out the capability in Australia. So that's kind of um, where we've come from. Um, what we do is we provide security, archiving, and continuity services for email delivered from the cloud uh, using a pure software as a service model. So it's our own proprietary intellectual property, our own software that we've built from the ground up to provide these services um, from a single unified technology platform in a unified converged way. Um, so just sort of breaking that down, security, what we mean by that is uh, antivirus and anti-spam um, type technologies or filtering um, to provide the kind of the core commoditized hygiene for email, if you like, security. 
Um, but also wrapped into that box of security is the ability for organizations to create and enforce granular policies around email processing. So things like data leak prevention, attachment management, anti-spoofing, document conversion policies, um, and more recently, a large file sending type capability. So lots and lots of additional policies over and above the standard kind of antivirus and anti-spam stuff. In the archiving space, what we do is we provide um, a bottomless, unlimited, perpetual archive of all emails. It's a tamper-proof archive, and it's enabling customers to tick a couple of boxes. One is around compliance, so we're providing a tamper-proof archive, capturing all emails in real time automatically, We've got the full record set, and enabling e-discovery from a centralized perspective. So if you've got any litigation, you can do all that from the administration console. You can create e-discovery cases, litigation holds, retention adjustments. So everything you'd expect from an on-premise type archive, you can do through Mindcast as well, but also um, addressing mailbox management concerns as well. So um, once you've got Mindcast in place, no more do you have to have huge mailboxes. You can run nice, lean, mean exchange environments, safe in the knowledge that every email is captured in Mindcast automatically, and end users, if you choose to allow them to have the search tools, are able to search, locate, um, and restore messages as they need to directly from the Mindcast archive. And we'll look at some of those tools um, towards the end of the presentation. And then finally, on the continuity front, this is where we're able to, because we've got a copy of all messages captured in real time in the cloud in a completely separate place to um, the customer's infrastructure, then um, that's how we go about providing 100% continuity SRA. So um, regardless of what's going on with your environment, and this is particularly pertinent when we're talking about migrations here, if you've got some sort of outage, either planned or unplanned, then through the various different tools and interfaces that we provide, end users are still able to send and receive uh, messages as usual. And that's seamless and transparent failover in the case of Outlook, as we'll see later in the demonstration. So that's what we're doing. It's a combination of security, archiving, and continuity. And I guess this is the typical sort of environment that we're looking to um, simplify. So when we talk to customers at the outset, typically what we'll have, or what they will have rather, is a number of um, different point solutions. So that might be an appliance, it might be a server, it might be a piece of software, to provide all these different functions that sit around your core email platform. So you might have um, a bit of software that does antivirus, anti-spam, something else that provides encryption, another bit of software that provides your disclaimer and stationary management, signatures and the like, and then perhaps an, an appliance or a web-based service that does DLP, for example. And, and the whole idea of Mindcast is that we can help organizations rationalize, simplify, consolidate that kind of complex setup. So rather than having all these different point solutions, each with their own um, hardware refresh software cycles, um, each with their own administration console, training requirements, administration overhead, rather than that, suck all that up into the cloud, consume those services as you need them, paying a nice predictable, um, just get rid of that, um, a nice predictable, um, per user-based price, um, and, sorry, I should have turned off my link, shouldn't I, prior to getting on a webinar. Yeah, yeah and, yeah, have all those services provided from a cloud-based service. So that's in terms of the gateway type functionality. Um, likewise, with the archive, rather than having to have an on-premise solution there, Mindcast can provide that archiving capability. So as messages are flowing into and out of Mindcast, and that's one of the key fundamental principles, by the way, all messages will flow in and out through Mindcast en route or from your exchange environment. So um, everything flows through us, and as we are um, delivering those messages and applying policies and cleaning those messages, we're also storing them in triplicate, and that's how we're archiving those messages. That last animation bit there as well was just showing what we call ingestion. So if you have any historical or legacy data, then um, we can import or ingest that data up into the cloud as well, uh, such that you can have all emails in one place, one point of e-discovery, one point of control. So that's the archiving piece. And then finally, the, the last piece of the Venn diagram is the continuity. So because we do have a copy of all messages, and by the way, we're getting internal messages by a journal connector. So we're getting the external message flow by virtue of being in the mail flow itself, and the internal message flow we get through a journal connection. And that means we've got a copy of all messages, um, and also, most importantly perhaps, we're giving your end users the ability to send and receive during an outage. So whether that's a server failure, or whether it's a complete site failure, it's a disaster, then um, through these various end user applications, an Outlook plugin, 
uh, a web mail interface and mobile applications, your end users are able to search their archived messages and also send and receive messages during that continuity event. Now, all the same principles apply in Office 365, by the way. So we are agnostic as to the customer's mail platform. It doesn't matter to us which version of Exchange you're running, whether it's 03, 07, 2010, Office 365, um, or indeed, it doesn't have to be Microsoft even. So we work with Domino customers as well, no development-wise. Any SMTP mail platform will integrate equally well with Mimecast. Um, and as I say, the same principles apply. So we provide all the same capability. The mail flows to us on the way down to Office 365 and out of 365. That enables us to do the policy application, the filtering of messages, the archiving, and then provide the continuity through the end user applications. Now, last year, we also added to the portfolio the ability to um, do file archiving. So it wasn't a radical change for us. It was kind of a natural extension or evolution from our existing technology such that now, as well as being able to archive and process and apply policies to all emails and attachments, we can also do that for other unstructured file types. So we can suck up into the cloud files from network shares, from people's home drives, and from public file sharing services such as Box and Dropbox. And again, get everything in one place in the Mimecast de facto information bank and give you the tools to be able to unlock the value of the information that's held within all those different files and emails. So rather than just regard this as some sort of static, dusty archive, actually give you the tools to be able to um, get some business intelligence, some useful analytics and value out of all the information that exists in whatever format it exists within Cast. So um, that's kind of what we do in a nutshell. Um, and this is how we're helping. So we're, we're moving from the screen on the left there. So that's the typical kind of fragmented email environment that we encounter and that's grown up around the customer's email environment and through Mimecast we help to unify that. So we help to converge those technologies and as I say consume them um, as you need based on a predictable per user base price rather than having lots of different point solutions to manage um, and so on. So that's um, what we do in a nutshell. Now um, in terms of the actual migration support, so hopefully now we can get into the actual crux around the migration support now that we're all clear hopefully on how Minecraft works, where we fit into the mail flow. Um, and let's talk specifically around how it goes about um, helping with migrations. So the first thing that we typically recommend in these scenarios is that you actually get your mail flowing through Mimecast down to your existing old uh, environment if you like. So in this picture here I'm just assuming that you're on Exchange um, 2003. Um, so what you would typically do is you would get connected up to Mimecast, so we have a very um, simple, straightforward, seven-step methodology for onboarding customers, um, and that involves basically change your MX records for your inbound message flow, so that everything inbound flows through Mimecast, we'll deliver it down to your Exchange 2003 server, and then for the outbound stuff, you set up new SMTP connectors to send everything outbound through Mimecast. And then from that point onwards, you will create policies within Mimecast, so that from now on in, you're going to have consistent application of policies and signatures and disclaimers. So regardless of what's going on with your local infrastructure during the migration, you're, you've got the sort of safety blanket or safety net of knowing that whatever policies you set up in Mimecast are now going to be enforced universally regardless of what's going on with Exchange on your premises. Um, likewise, because everything's now flowing through Mimecast, we're going to be storing those messages. Now, depending upon what service you take from us, we'll store them for different periods of time. So if you're looking for a long-term archiving solution, then we'll retain those messages perpetually, so forever, for, a long, for as long as you're a Mindcast customer, within the cloud. We store them in triplicates. Um, everything's encrypted at rest. So um, what I should have mentioned is we're ISO 27001 certified, so very keen, as you can imagine, on um, security. Email's clearly the crown jewels for many um, organizations. So you have to be very good at security, so our ISO 27001 certification underpins that. Um, so all messages are stored in Mimecast, encrypted at rest, um, encrypted in transport if necessary via TLS as well, as you deem appropriate by policies set up within the administration console. Um, if you're not looking for a long-term archive solution, then we can either store them um, for two months if you're just looking for continuity, or for 30 days if you're just looking for a sort of um, standard, simple security solution. So if all you're looking for is antivirus and spam, that's fine. We can just do that as well. We don't have to bundle all of the services together. We can just provide security services and in which case we retain stuff for 30 days. But the 
point is, from the point of coming on board with Mimecast, all messages are being stored for a minimum of 30 days in our platform. And now the key thing to note here is that um, all this can happen in the background without end users having to be disrupted or even knowing that anything's happening. So all this can be done in parallel to your migration planning efforts. Um, you can be merrily doing this in the background, setting up policies, testing policies, making sure disclaimers are in place, making sure your black and white lists work and so on, um, without end users needing to know that anything different has happened. And the next thing to do, once the mail flow is working, is to think about migrating some of that big data that exists up into the MyCast cloud. So typically, mail will exist, of course, in people's mailboxes. And depending upon how you're running things at the moment, it might be you have quotas in place. It might be that you don't, and you've got huge, unwieldy, bloated mailboxes. Um, but also, typically, you will have PST files scattered about the organization on network shares, on people's laptops, or whatever. And this step is all around pulling together, harvesting all of that data, and getting it up into the cloud. So get it up into Mimecast through our ingestion process, um, such that you've got a backup of all of that data prior to actually migrating the user data or the user mailboxes. So um, have a copy of all the messages in Mimecast from people's mailboxes and your historical and legacy data through our ingestion process. Um, this also, of course, means that you've now got smaller mailboxes to migrate. So no more do you have to uh, migrate those huge bloated mailboxes because you can ingest the, the lion's share of that data into Mimecast and have nice small lean mean mailboxes to migrate to the new environment. So you start from a nice clean environment from day one rather than trying to migrate huge mailboxes. And it's through the end user tools that we provide that end users are able to get to all their archive messages that aren't available directly in Outlook and Exchange at the time. And we'll see those in a second. Um, and of course, from this point of time, now you've got the single point of e-discovery and control. So you've got all messages from all time um, captured in the Mimecast cloud. Everything from now on is being captured as it's sent and received, or it's captured via the journal connector if it's an internal message. And everything historical, so prior to coming on board with Mimecast, will be in Mimecast due to the ingestion process. And that means that now you've got everything in one place. It makes e-discovery very simple, very intuitive, and very fast. So you can create e-discovery cases, you can do employee investigations, you can expose those um, investigations to different people internally and externally through e-discovery cases and the like. So that's what we do. And as I mentioned, we will retain those messages perpetually by default, unless, of course, you set up rules within the administration console to um, make it less than perpetual. So of course, sometimes you might have some sort of re regulatory thing that says, well, actually, we can't keep confidential messages or messages from so-and-so um, for the full forever period, uh, and therefore you can put in place very granular policies within Mimecast that can reduce that retention period down for specific mail flows as you see fit. So once you've got all the data in Mimecast, you've got everything flowing in and out through Mimecast down to Exchange 2003, you've got all your historical data and mailbox data into Mimecast backed up, safe and secure, resilient, um, regardless of what's going on with your own um, customer infrastructure. You're then in a position to think about the actual user migration of mailboxes. So in this picture here, I'm just considering, let's say we're moving from Exchange 03 to Exchange 20 pen. And by the way, um, one of the key sort of benefits of Mimecast, particularly around the migration activities, is the fact that we are agnostic to um, whatever mail platform you're running. So as I mentioned earlier, we work with any version of Exchange, Office 365, and also however it's deployed. So it doesn't matter to Mimecast whether that exchange in the new world is going to be on your premises, whether it's hosted, um, or indeed if it's um, Office 365. Mimecast works with any and all of the above. As long as it's SMTP mail, and we've got an IP address to push messages down to, then uh, all the functionality I've described works equally well with any and all mail platforms, um, including hybrid setups. So it might be that you're not just moving from 03 to 2010. It might be you're moving to Exchange 2013 mailboxes for some users, but Office 365 for other users. That's quite a common scenario we're seeing. And that's cool as well. So we can obviously support those hybrid environments, and we can just push messages to the appropriate or most appropriate site or server, depending upon whatever delivery rules you put within Mimecast. So again, this means that you've got consistent policy application in both the old and new environments as you're migrating those mailboxes. Um, and prior to actually doing the mailbox migrations themselves, what I'd recommend is that you roll out the Outlook plugin that we provide. So we provide a plugin that we'll have a look at in a second, and that's what provides the 100% continuity. So if you do have any outages, planned or unplanned, during the migration process, 
then end users are still able to send and receive messages as usual. Everything's flowing through Mimecast, so even in a continuity scenario, so the server's down for whatever reason, you're repurposing, let's say, for the migration attempts or efforts, um, people can still send and receive as usual through Outlook, through a webmail interface we provide, um, and all policies get applied consistently as usual. So external parties don't need to know that exchange is down. They still see messages coming out with the same disclaimers and signatures as before, and all your DLP policies are being applied in the same way as ever. Um, and what you would typically do here is you would use the um, granular routing rules within Mimecast to be able to, to set up and have control over the routing process. So um, you could, for example, initially when you first go on board, you would have a simple rule in this example, pushing all your emails down to that single Exchange 2003 server, and then as you um, migrate user mailboxes across to the new environment, you would just tweak that rule within Mimecast to say, well, actually, um, for the AD group known as IT Pilot, then we're going to put in a specific routing rule for those guys, such that those emails inbound get routed down to the new Exchange 2010 environment, whereas everybody else is, still gets pushed down to the old Exchange 20, 2003 environment until such time you move the next group along or across. And again, you just tweak the rules you need to. It's giving you very um, specific control over mail flows as managed within the cloud. So it takes away some of that complexity and um, dependency of local routing if you can control that at your fingertips in real time through the administration console that Mimecast provides. So that, in essence, are the kind of key elements of any migration with Mimecast. It's about getting the core mail flow flowing through Mimecast in the existing old world, if you like, getting your policies in place, migrating your big data up into Mimecast, backing it up um, such that you can export it directly from Mimecast if you need to in the future, um, and then providing the tools to give your end users that 100% email availability capability. And then once all that's in place, you're ready to just move mailboxes across, and we can help with the routing of messages during that process. And then once it's done, um, you can then decommission your Exchange 03 environment tidy up the routing rules so that everything's now pointing at Exchange 2010 in this simplified example, and um, job done. So um, hopefully that kind of makes sense in terms of how we're going to provide um, support for your migration. Now just to bring some of that stuff to life then, it's probably now is a good time to take a look at some of the end user applications that I've mentioned, just to kind of bring them to life and get away from PowerPoint. Um, let's have a look, perhaps to start with, um, with MSA, which is Mimecast Services for Outlook. So this is our um, Outlook plugin. So we provide this as a .msi file. You can roll it out to your desktops and laptops as you see fit via group policy, via SCCN, whatever software distribution tool you use. Works with all versions of Outlook from 2003 onwards. And once you've got that in place as an end user, what happens is you see this um, Mimecast tab at the top here. Now, you can see I've got various different options here um, to be able to control various bits and pieces and invoke the various bits of functionality that Mimecast provides. Now, as an administrator, you can decide specifically what functionality different users or groups of users can see and can do. So you don't have to give all this functionality to all users, it's your call. Um, but if you want to, this is where you can allow end users to search their own personal mailbox archive as it exists within the Mimecast data centers. Um, so when I type in birthday in that um, search box there, it goes up to the cloud it trawls through my own personal mailbox archive um, for any messages or attachments with the word birthday in them. And in very short order there, you'll see it's pulled back 359 messages. This is my live system, by the way. Um, and then I can click on those messages, fetch the full message back from the cloud. Um, so I can see that message. I can um, interact with it whilst it still exists in the cloud. So I can reply, I can reply all. Or if I need to, I can save a copy locally back to my Exchange mailbox. So just to be clear here, what this would do is it creates a copy of the message from the Mimecast archive back to my Exchange world. So it's not moving it, it's a tamper-proof archive, remember. Once stuff gets in there, it gets in there automatically in real time. And once it's in there, there's nothing that an end user can do to delete a message from the archive. You've got the full record set forever, providing you've got the perpetual retention uh, facility. Um, so they can restore messages back. Uh, they can do more sophisticated searches. So rather than just the basic search, they can look for specific phrases, exclude phrases. Uh, they can look over particular date frames, look in certain types of attachments, not others, and so on. And then they can save those searches and run them ad hoc as they need to. Um, do I want to change the color scheme? Uh, no, thanks. Um, I can run those searches ad hoc as I need to. 
Um, so this is common search. So this one's I'm looking at any emails with the word test sent to Gmail in the last six months. And there again, you'll see in very short order, thanks to the grid architecture that we use, those searches come up very quickly and easily. So the whole idea is that end users have got that at their fingertips. Um, so you don't have to have huge mailboxes. They can find stuff through the archive search or through replicated folders. So the other or another capability can provide is the ability to replicate folder structure. So you'll see under my inbox, I've got a bunch of subfolders. And with the Minecraft add-on um, called Archive Power Tools, um, we can mirror that um, folder structure within the Minecraft archive. So you'll see here, I get this additional tree structure called Minecraft Archive, um, whereby under my inbox, I have all of my folder structure, um, including any folders that no longer exist in Exchange. So you'll see one here called IT. Um, if I just scoot back up to the top again, you'll notice that in my Exchange world, it no longer exists. And that's because we run a very um, tight ship, as it were, with Exchange. We delete anything on Exchange that's older than six months, safe in the knowledge that end users can get to it, either via the search or by going to replicated folders. So that's the archive search. Um, there's also things around the gateway in here. So you can allow end users to manage their block and permit lists for spam control. So we, we control those at both an individual level as well as at a global account level, which you manage through the administration console. Um, and kind of coupled with that, the ability for end users in real time to see their own personal on hold queue. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I get any suspected spam, it ends up in this on hold queue. I can see it directly in real time through Outlook. I can then, there's nothing in there at the moment, um, but if there was, I could decide to release it, reject it, permit or block it. You can also turn on um, digest messages, of course, as well. So scheduled messages such that periodically, again, if I get suspected spam, <coughs> the end user gets a message notifying them of that and telling them to call the help desk or, or giving them hyperlinks to be able to release or reject it from within the email itself. Now, going back to the migration support, the piece you're probably most interested in would be um, the continuity elements of the Outlook plugin. So this does work by default automatically and transparently, but given this is my live mailbox, I'm actually going to invoke it manually. I can't take down our exchange, unfortunately. So if I click on activate continuity, You'll see um, that I've entered into continuity mode. And also, you'll notice at the bottom right there that it's forced me to work offline. So now, even though I'm offline, um, the key point with Mimecast is that I can still continue sending and receiving messages as usual. So if I send a message to my Gmail account, um, then let's do a test at, how are we doing for time, crikey, 11.08. Not bad, we're about right, I think. Um, so if I send that message, what you'll notice is it sits in my outbox for a few moments, but in the background, the Outlook plugin will realize that Exchange is not available for me. And in this instance, it's because I'm working offline. And it will fire that message out uh, directly via Mimecast. So it fires up an HTTPS session to Mimecast. And that message will then flow out um, through Mimecast. will apply all the usual policies in the usual way. will apply all the um, disclaimers as usual. Um, and as far as Minecraft is concerned, it doesn't really care whether you're running in continuity mode or active mode. Everything's just flowing through Minecraft as usual. So that's the continuity elements. Um, there's lots of other bits and pieces in here. I probably haven't got time to show them all. But just to touch on some other gateway capabilities, when you're composing a message, um, you can, again, if you choose to, it's all configurable through the administration console. You could empower end users to decide what policies to apply when. So for example, um, you could allow end users to decide when to encrypt a connection, what stationary to append. So um, you can set up various different templates. You can either apply with all of these buttons here. You can just apply them through policies set up in the administration console. Or if you choose to, you can allow end users to make that decision through um, the Outlook plugin here. So I can decide what templates to put on there. I can decide what document conversion policy to apply. So the message is, or an attachment is flowing through Mimecast, I might choose to convert it from Word to PDF. I might want to remove the metadata and the properties, um, and so on. A couple of options around attachment management as well. We can do strip and link, whereby any attachments on an email are removed as they flow through Mimecast, and we'll replace it with a hyperlink. And that's what gets delivered down to the recipient's mailbox. That can be applied inbound or outbound, um, thereby reducing the size of those mails. And only when the recipient clicks on the hyperlink Will it then download the full attachment? Um, and we've also just, well, actually, we haven't quite released it yet. It's just being productized now, uh, a large file sending capability from Outlook. So this is where I know I'm sending a huge file up to 2 gig. Um, I don't want it to go to Exchange, because it's going to clog up Exchange. And what happens is if I click on this button here, 
it will enable me to send that message directly through Mimecast, bypassing Exchange, and also be able to do things like put an expiry date on that attachment. So I could make it active for just a day or three weeks, three months, whatever I'm comfortable with. And I can also track who's opened it when. So the attachment flows through Mimecast. We um, store it securely. We notify the recipients and invite them to log into a secure portal to be able to read that. So this is the Outlook plugin, um, very briefly. Um, perhaps the other big end user bit or end user interface is this thing, which is the um, Mimecast personal portal, um, which is our webmail client or interface. So if I log into our demo environment here, um, if I can just remember my address, I think that's it. Uh, just log into that. By the way, one of the uh, functions we provide is um, an Active Directory sync, by the way, LDAP or LDAP S connection, such that this can be all linked through to your Active Directory passwords. So I don't have to remember a separate password for Minecast. I can use my domain password to log in. Now that said, we can also set up cloud passwords as well. Uh, so yes, typically, because it's a demo, I'm just going to forget who I am. My day is it for demos today? Ah, there we go. Actually, it's, it's, that's actually the administration console. We'll come back to that in a second. Let's log into um, the personal portal, the webmail interface. This is the end user app. Sorry, folks. Uh, let's just get the right thing here. So this is the other end user application interface. So if they're not an Outlook user, or let's say they're a desktop user and you've got a true disaster, so they can't get into the office, as long as they can get to a browser, then they're able to launch this 24-7 from any browser to see their online inbox, to see um, their sent items, to compose new messages. They can do this anytime. Of course, it's particularly valuable during a continuous with the R event, but it's available 24-7 anyway. Um, they can do searches, much like we did in Outlook. They can search through all of their mailbox archive, including ingested messages. Um, we can also provide a read-only of calendars. So again, particularly useful in, say, a migration scenario. You know that if Exchange goes down during the migration, then end users can get to their calendars and see where they need to be. Um, they can see those replicated folders. So you remember I had replicated folders. These are t also visible through this interface as well different folders because I'm in a different account. That's why you might be wondering. Um, as well as being able to do all the other stuff around managing black and white lists and seeing my personal on hold queue. So in this demo account, I do have something on hold at the moment. I can review that um, and I can decide whether to release or delete that message. So um, that's the other kind of main end user interface. We also provide applications for all mobile platforms. Um, <clears throat> now currently, the only one that provides continuity is BlackBerry. Um, but that's about to change, so um, we're just internally testing full applications for the other platforms. So we provide apps for all platforms, but for Android, iOS, and Windows Phone, currently it's optimized for archive search. So there's limited continuity availability in there, but that's set to change um, later this year. There will be apps that provide full continuity from those platforms as well. At the moment, it's purely for BlackBerry. So that's the end user stuff. Um, crikey, in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend any time at all, well, a very, very minimal time in the admin console, this is it. Um, just to show you, it's a single browser-based console for everything that Minecast provides. So whether you're looking to um, do <coughs> security and policy-related things, archive searching, continuity things, um, file archive, whatever it is, reporting, it's all managed to be a single interface. <coughs> it's very easy to navigate around, different tabs on the top here. Um, it's all role-based access control, so you can have different admins with different rights within here. Um, and these, for example, are the various different policies that you can set up, configure, and enforce through Mimecast. But I think uh, in the interest of time, I'll leave that there. What I would urge and suggest is, yeah, if you need to do a deeper dive into this, more than happy to set up separate sessions afterwards. We can get into the end user apps more, and I can give you a proper run-through of the administration console. Um, but for now, we'll probably leave that there um, and just come back to my final slide in the deck here, which is... Um, this one. So just revisiting um, those risks that we talked about at the very outset of the call. And hopefully now it will become clearer as to where Mimecast is going to assist with that. So in terms of email downtime, through the Outlook plugin, through the webmail interface, um, through the mobile apps, BlackBerry in the first instance, but other platforms soon, we're able to provide that 100% email availability throughout. So even if you're repurposing a server and something goes down, then You've got a safety net that end users can use Outlook to continue sending and receiving messages. 
In terms of lost and corrupted data, um, through the ingestion process, you can get all of that big data up into the cloud, into Mimecast, prior to actually doing the user migration. So that's good. And then if you need to, you can export it directly from the administration console. Or end users can, um, what's the word, restore it themselves directly to the Outlook plugin as well, actually. Um, interruption to policy enforcement, that's not the case with Mimecast. You've got all mail flowing through Mimecast for both the old environment and the new, going through a consistent set of policies. One point of policy application, one point of control. And that's true whether you're in continuity mode or not. Um, Interdependent dependencies with other systems. Well, as I mentioned, we work with all versions of Exchange, however it's deployed, including Office 365 cloud deployments um, and other platforms as well. So yes, we are a Microsoft Gold partner, um, but we also provide support, as I say, for things like Lotus Domino as well. So if, if you happen to be on the call because you're considering a migration from Domino to Exchange, then all those same principles I just described are equally applicable. Um, and then that's how we're going to help you mitigate um, the risk of delays and, in, and um, spiraling costs. So with Mimecast, it's all packaged up and you've got nice, predictable, transparent pricing based on the active number of users. So uh, you just tell us the number of people sending or receiving emails, they're not bothered about resource accounts, they're not bothered about the number of domains, it's just the number of active users and you pay a per annum per user price based on which package you choose. And we try to keep it fairly simple, there's a security only package or two flavors of that, there's a security and continuity package that we call Express and then there's the full shooting match which is called our enterprise service which is security, archiving and continuity. So, um, I've probably rattled on enough there, getting on for 45 minutes, so I think that concludes what I was going to say. Um, so now is probably the time to deal with the questions. Hopefully you've been firing questions through the, the FAQ panel there. Um, now what I need to do is work out how I hand back to Helen and Sarah. Let me just change back to Sarah now, and they will chair the, um, the question and answer session. Are you there, Sarah? Hi, Sarah. I can't hear you. Are you still on mute? Or? Hi, Paul. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. I was still on mute. Hello. Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, so, guys, we'll now go, now go to questions. So if you do have any questions, please type them in the box on the right-hand side. Um, we'll just sort of wait a few minutes to see if any come up, and then we can go through those. I think just, just while we're waiting, uh, yeah, what I would urge is that, you know, that was necessarily, unfortunately, quite a generic presentation, so I would urge that if any of that has kind of piqued your interest um, or kind of had a few light bulb moments there, then please do um, get in touch through, through Bytes or through myself directly, and we'll be happy to um, sit down and chat to your own sort of specific requirements and environments it stands at the moment, and we can see how Microsoft could help there. Um, okay, so we've got one question here. Um, how does your continu continuity option work with, Minecraft, work with Microsoft Office 365? That's from Karen. Yeah, so uh, yeah, okay, thanks Karen. So um, yeah, absolutely, so exactly the same principles applies in Office 365 as it does for every other mail platform. So if you recall, all messages are flowing in and out through Mimecast, and that's true for Office 365 as well. So messages will flow in through Mimecast, we'll store them in triplicate in real time as they flow through us. Internal messages will be capturing via a journal connector from Office 365. So as messages internally are sent within Office 365, they too are captured, pushed up to Mimecast, we store them again in triplicate. Um, and that's, that's how we go about providing that continuity. So then, if Office 365 goes down, heaven forbid, I think the SLA is 99.9%, but that does actually represent, I can't remember what it is, that's eight hours outage per annum. So if there is a period of outage of um, Office 365 exchange online, then during those periods, um, your end users are still able to send and receive directly through Mimecast. So using the Outlook plugin, using the webmail interface we looked at, um, they're able to send and receive emails directly via Mimecast. In that instance, what happens is messages effectively bypass Office 365. They go directly to Mimecast via a secure HTTPS connection. Um, they'll flow through the cloud. We'll archive them as usual. We'll apply policies and filter them as usual. Um, and that's how we go about providing the continuity. Likewise, anything inbound during that continuity event, it will flow into Mimecast. Mimecast will know that Office 365 is unavailable because it won't be able to establish a connection down to it it will forward the message on 
to the user's inbox within Outlook, and also it'll be visible through the webmail interface and the mobile apps. So um, that's how they will continue carrying on working, even if Office 365 is down, and hence that's why we're providing the, or that's how we provide the 100% availability so it can just augment Office 365. So I think you know, asked one Office 365, the kind of key message for us is that we're not, you know, absolutely we're not looking to replace Office 365 by no means. Mimecast is always about providing complementary services to whatever mail platform you're on and that's true for Office 365 as well. So Office 365 we see it as a very, very good platform, it's the future, we see all mail going that way eventually. Um, and where Mimecast comes in, it's to provide sort of enhancements and comp complement the Office 365 service. So in terms of the security, we're providing enhanced policy control over and above the Exchange Online Protection piece. Yes, that's great for standard AVAS, but if you want the advanced sort of quarantine stuff, the end user ability to um, apply policies and things like that, and that's where Mimecast comes in. Um, we provide the full tamper-proof enterprise archive as opposed to the personal archive that Office 365 provides, and we provide the continuity over and above the 99.9% .9 that uh, Office 365 gives. So, um, yeah, hopefully that was a, a long-winded answer to a short question. Great. Thanks, Paul. And we've got um, another one from Nick. What are the arrangements for exit strategy to address the problem of lock-in? Is there a yeah. similar structured process for taking the archive out? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. And um, yeah, it's something that we're completely upfront about. So we're not, um, yeah, and we, we write that into the contract as well. So yeah, we have that discussion at the outset. Um, absolutely agree and appreciate you need to see what happens at the end of the relationship. Obviously, we want to keep them as long as possible. But if, yeah, at the end of five years or whatever, you need to get your data out of Mimecast, then we have um, a, a bizarre term called exgestion, which is rather bonkers. But it's, as you say, it's the opposite of ingestion. So we um, can effectively plug encrypted hard drives into the grid and for all of your emails and only your emails we can uh, export or extract all of that data from the Minecast grid, give it you back in um, universal format and uh, on encrypted drives and um, yeah, that's, that's your data back in your hands. So we absolutely acknowledge in the contract that we are a data processor. You own the data, so absolutely you're entitled to get it back. Um, and you're also, by the way, able to export directly from the administration console. So you can do that through the admin console yourselves. But of course, after three years, you might have several terabytes in Mimecast, and it might just not be practical to do that. So absolutely, we're happy to write into the contract that we'll do that exgestion process as well at the end of, end of the term. Great. And um, does PST ingestion do any deduplication of messages? Um, yes, it does, actually. So, um, yes is the short answer. It does deduplication, although you might say, well, you don't need to care, to be honest, um, because, um, yeah, you're not charged based on the volume of data. It's the number of active users when it comes to archiving messages. Um, actually, that said, for ingestion, it, sorry, it is, it's ingestion is the exception in that it is charged per, per megabyte or gigabyte. Um, and therefore, yeah, I guess these duplication is in your interests because you don't want to have to ingest stuff five times if it exists in five different bases. So we do, yeah, do deduplication during ingestion on a batch basis, yes. Perfect, thank you. And another one from Lee. Do messages sent received during continuity get delivered back to the local exchange server, Office 365, after the outage? Yes, they do. Sorry, I should have said that. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, everything gets delivered where it needs to during the outage, but it also gets queued such that when the mail server comes back online, whether that be Exchange 2010, 2013, Office 365, then when they come back online, Mimecast automatically sees that. We'll then drip feed all the messages that were sent and received during that outage back down to the mail server, and everything gets synced up and ends up in the right place. Um, so yes, everything will be where it needs to be. And, and the final point on that is when it comes to the Outlook plugin, then it does a clever thing as well in that it will see that Exchange is available again, or Office 365 is available again. It will automatically restore the flow back through Office 365 or Exchange, rather than going directly through Mimecast. Um, and it will do a, do a deduplication, I can't say that, um, within the user's um, Outlook inbox as well. So even though they might well have received a message um, directly from Mimecast during the outage, and now they've also got a local copy in Exchange, um, or Office 365, then um, the, the plugin is pretty clever and it does a, an instantaneous um, deduplication. So the end user only sees one instance of it in their Outlook inbox. 
Lovely, thank you. Um, that's all the questions we have for now. Does anyone else have any other questions they'd like to, to submit before, before we wrap up? We'll just give another couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. Of course, if there's anything you wanted to see in more detail, please do let us know in, in the feedback and we can, we can give you a, a call to follow up and, and set another demo up on, on what you wanted to see in particular. There's no problem. No, I don't think there's any more questions coming. So I guess we'll we'll wrap everything up. Thanks very much, Paul. You're welcome. Um, and thanks everyone for joining.